بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد First of all, I take this opportunity to welcome one and all to this program on the blessed lands. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala accept our attending and may Allah make it a source of hidayat and inspiration for all of us. Remember this journey towards Sham is one of the most incredible journeys. This is a journey of a lifetime. Indeed, this is a journey that will revive the spirit of Iman within us. While people may boast about traveling to various different parts of the world, people may boast about traveling to Europe and to Paris and to the Far East. Indeed, fortunate is that person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the tawfiq to travel to the blessed lands. First of all, we need to understand when we speak about Sham, which area does Sham cover? What does it refer to? So there is a map here now to make it easy for us to understand the borders of Sham. If you see towards the north, you will find that some part of Turkey falls within Sham. In fact, the historians have written the Mount Taurus. There is also one place called Tarasus. So that is where Sham starts. And then when you go to the eastern side, then you will find that it extends right up to the Euphrates River. So that is some part of Iraq. Then you've got the entire Syria. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for the people of Syria. You have got Lebanon. You have got Jordan. You have got Palestine. And then you come right down to Arish in Egypt. There is a place that is called Arish in Egypt. So some part of Egypt also falls under Sham. And that is why many ulama mentioned that the Mount Sinai, and if someone visited Egypt then they would know about the Sinai area, also falls under the borders of Sham. Now Sham is a blessed land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran Sharif, there are about five ayats, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the blessings of Sham. Subhan al-ladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawla. Allah says, al-ladhi barakna hawla, speaking about the miraj and isra, that land that we have given barakat around it. When we speak about barakat and we speak about blessings, Hazrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah narrates, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also made dua for Sham. Allahumma barik lana fi shamina. This was the land of Anbiya alayhi salam and Sahaba. So these were the spiritual blessings. Remember the Wahi came down in Sham. This is where deen spread from in the initial stages. This was the Qibla of the previous Anbiya alayhi salam. So this is a blessed land. And ulama explain that there's also worldly blessings to this land, not only dini blessings, there's material blessings. Allah baratna hawla bil anhar wal ashjar wal thimar, looking at beautiful rivers and also beautiful trees and delicious fruits. As we see the picture here, Sham is known for the delicious fruits. If someone ever visits Sham, you should make it a point of eating the delicious fruits and vegetables that are available in Sham. As far as the virtues of Sham, there are whole kitabs written, prepared on the virtues of Sham. If you have to speak about the virtues of Sham, this one session will not be sufficient. In one hadith it is mentioned, Hazrat Zain bin Sabit radiallahu ta'ala and says, we were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tuba al sham In some narrations is mentioned, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeated it three times, Ya Tuba al sham Glad tidings to Sham. 
What an excellent place is Sham. So Sahaba asked, "Niyin dalika ya Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Why do you say it is so fortunate?" Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned, "Li'anna malaika al-Rahman basita tun ajnihataha aliha because the farishtas they have spread their wings over Sham." In another hadith, it is mentioned, Hazrat Ibn Hawala radiyallahu taala says. Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was speaking about different groups towards Qiyamah, and Ibn Hawala radiyallahu an asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Choose for me, khirli ya Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned, "Alika bi Sham, fa innaha khiratullahi min ardi, yajtabi ilaha khiratuhu min ibadi." Hold firm to Sham because this is the chosen path from the earth of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala draws to it His very special servants. And in the same hadith, it's mentioned after a few lines: "For in Allah had tawakkal ali bi Sham wa Ali." Allah has taken responsible for me regarding Sham and the people of Sham. Then the hadith speaks about Ardul Mahshari wal Manshar, the place of gathering and resurrection. Ulama explain, and this is proven in authentic hadith, that just before Kiamat. There will be a huge fire that comes out from Aden in Yemen, and this will push the people towards Sham. So the place of gathering, and when people are resurrected on the day of Kiamat, they will all be gathered on the plains of Sham. So even though someone may not visit Sham in his life, on the day of Kiamat he will be standing on the plains of Sham. Remember, in the Malamalu bin Niyat. All your actions are judged on your intentions. Your intentions play a very important role on how you will benefit from this place and how you will conduct yourself in this place. So make sure that we continuously rectify our intentions. First of all, whenever we do any action, the first intention should be the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Remember, if someone is traveling for the pleasure of Allah, he will never do anything that breaks the commands of Allah. So you will not find any free intermingling between males and females. You will not find pictures taken of inanimate objects. You will not find people taking selfies. Why? Because they doing it for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and they are very cognizant that they must not break the laws of Allah in any way. Visiting the third haram, Maymuna, the freed slave of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she says, "Hold to Ya Rasul Allah, Aftini fi Beit Al Muqaddas." I said, "O Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, tell us about Beitul Muqaddas." So Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ardul Mahshari wal Manshar." This is the place of gathering and resurrection. And Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Itu ilay that try and go to the Beitul Muqaddas. Fa inna salat fihi ka albi salat fi ghairi. Performing one salah in the Beitul Muqaddas is like equivalent to performing thousand salahs in any other place." And the other hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that speak about fifty thousand salas. Imagine fifty thousand salas. How many years you have to read salah for you to get fifty thousand salah? So this should be the intention visiting the third haram, gaining the blessings. This is a land of baraka. Respected friends, if there's anything lacking in our lives that we need in this day and time, it is barakat. We need the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And remember, to get the blessings, we have to connect our hearts to Allah. When you connect your hearts to Allah, Allah will give you from the blessings. Appreciating the sacrifice of Sahaba and Ambiya, you go into these lands, you hearing the stories of Sahaba, of pious people, of Ambiya, what efforts they made in their lives, what sacrifices they made in their lives. Let us appreciate their sacrifices and also make an effort to follow their footsteps. So the intentions are a very, very important aspect. Then also learning and implementing the lessons as you go through the journey. Different lessons will be pointed out. These lessons are meant for us to implement and bring in our lives. When a person arrives in Jordan, then Alhamdulillah for South Africans we get the visa on arrival, and the visa is also free for South Africans. If a person has made prior arrangements for his transport, then he will await his tour guide or his driver to come for him, 
And if he has not made prior arrangements, then when he would arrive in the airport, there would be taxis also available. Also in the airport, a person can change his currency, his dollars to Jordanian dinars, which is actually quite strong. When you go into Jordan, there are many places for you to change your currency. This is the first segment and it is like the first day that we are coming now to Jordan. So on the first day, what is we going to do a ziyarat of the Amman city and most importantly, we are going to visit the cave of the seven sleepers. The cave of the seven sleepers, for us to understand the significance of this, we will see the Surah Al-Kahf that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had named an entire surah after the cave of the seven sleepers. And as we see now, the map in front of us, we see where is Amman, and it's about just over 10 kilometers out of Amman. So a person would travel with the taxi or his tour guide. Also before going, you will find out the times, because certain times this cave is closed. So you will find out which times it is open and which times it is closed. Now regarding this cave, there are a few views. We're just mentioning some of the views. Some say it is in Turkey, in Torasus. You know, we pointed out Torasus on the map of Sham. Another view is that it is in Spain. Then the third view is that it is in Yemen. And the fourth view is that it is in Jordan. Now when did they discover this cave? So it is mentioned that in the year 1953, there was a researcher by the name of Taysir Zubyan. He was informed of this cave. And he decided to take a journey and he had to travel off route. And when he came here, it was very, very dark. He found out from a shepherd who told him that this cave, there's some graves in this cave. And he goes into the cave, but it was covered with sand and stones. And it was difficult for him to make out anything. After this, he was assisted by an archaeologist by the name of Rafiq Ad Dujani. He called him in also to make sure that they are on the right track and they have found the cave. And eventually, when they were quite confident that this is probably the cave, then they requested the authorities to do excavations. And excavations were commenced in the year 1961. Now, someone may ask, why do we give preference to this view? There are different views, but there is some very, very strong evidence to suggest that this cave is actually the cave of the seven sleepers. And a lot of the evidence they had found after the excavations had taken place. Firstly, they say that the location of the cave, the Quran Sharif and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this cave. Allah speaks about the sun not hitting these people directly, but the sun passing through the right and the left side. So the mouth of this cave or the entrance of this cave is towards the south. So this tells you that this fits the description of the Quran Sharif. Then after the excavations, they have discovered that there is a masjid above the cave. And the Quran also speaks about the people of authority at that time. They said, masjida. We're going to build a masjid. So they found the remnants of this masjid, that there's still the remnants of the masjid. And when someone would go there, he would see it also. There would be some pictures that would show us this. Then Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, who was a senior sahabi and scholar and the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one view of his is mentioned, the Qur'an speaks about the word Raqim. Am asibda anna ashab al-kahfi war Raqim. He says that Raqim was the name of a place near Ayla. Now Ayla is in Aqaba in Jordan. And he says that this cave is somewhere near Ayla. So this also would indicate to the fact that this cave was somewhere in that vicinity, in that country, somewhere in Jordan. There are other reasons also, but time does not permit us to go into more details. We will see a picture now on the top of the cave. This is the remnants of the masjid. And ulama explained that this is 10 meters by 10 meters. And when they did the excavations, they found these remnants. Then on the top of the cave, you will also see that there is a hole 
and there is a passage that goes into the cave which served like the purpose of a chimney. So there was like a chimney on the top of the cave. Now we are going inside the cave. You will see that there are two tombs. Inside the cave, there are eight graves like this. As we see the two here, there are eight like this here. Then you will see towards your left hand side, there is a viewing hole. There is a circle around it now. You can view the bones that they had found, the remnants that they had found in the cave when they had discovered the cave. And this is the picture now of the remains and the bones that they had discovered. Inside the cave, when you would look at this part of the cave, then the guides would normally tell you, the Quran Shah says, وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِّنْ That these people, these youngsters, when they went into the cave, they were in a spacious part of the cave. So this was the spacious part of the cave wherein they were resting. On the left hand side there is a showcase. And this showcase has got some of the relics that they found after excavations. Now when you would look into these relics, you would see that there were some lotas and some jugs made from earthenware which they would use to make wudu. These were some of the relics that they had discovered after excavating and clearing up the place. So very briefly we are going to try and cover this incident of the people of the cave. As I mentioned the 15 Sipara of the Quran Sharif, the pagans of Makkah Mukarama had challenged Rasulullah with three questions. And these questions were passed on to them from the Jewish scholars of Medina Munawara. One of the questions they asked Rasulullah was regarding the people of the cave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed this incident in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah says, we will reveal to you their incident with the truth. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ These were youngsters who brought Iman in the Lord and we increased them in Hidayat. The commentators of the Qur'an Sharif explain that these youngsters were living in this area wherein idol worship was forced by the ruler and the king. And the people who made research in this, they also mentioned that very likely, although the Tafsir Kitabs normally speak about Dikyanus, but they had mentioned that it's very likely it was Emperor Trajan who had taken control over this land of Jordan in the year 106. So it is known about him, even in the books of history, that he would kill the devoted Christians at that time, and he would persecute them, he would force people to worship idols. So these youngsters had to attend a certain fair. And while the fair was on, that Iman in their hearts did not allow them to remain in that environment of sin and haram. So one by one, they started leaving this environment. And they went into a distant place and they sat under a tree. The first person came, the second person came, until seven of them had gathered under this tree. No one knew anyone. No one was related to anyone. They were complete strangers to one another. So they were very afraid to speak also. They thought to themselves, what if there's a spy here and it is possible that the spy now will spy us out to the king and we will have to suffer the consequences. For a period of time there was silence until one person spoke out and he said, we all have left that fair and we all have gathered here. There must be definitely some reason for this. Don't you think it is appropriate that we share our thoughts? So one person started speaking and he broke the ice. He mentioned the reason and he said, I cannot take this anymore, this is disgusting. What our people are doing, how can they worship idols? They carve out the idol in the early parts of the morning with their hands and in the remaining part of the day they worship the idol. What type of logic is this? And then obviously the others also had the courage to speak. So then they decided that they are going to set up a place of worship wherein they will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will not involve themselves in any types of idol worship. Teaching us a very important lesson, respected friends, when there is an environment of sin, we move away from that environment. If we cannot change the environment, then we leave the environment, we move away from the environment. But now they became the talk of the town. Everyone is speaking about these youngsters. They have set up a place of worship. 
and gradually the news reached the king and the king had summoned them and the king asked them what is this what is this religion you people are following and who is this lord you are worshiping so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَرَبَطَنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَوْمُ فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Allah strengthened their hearts at that time. They were not intimidated by the fear of the king. And they openly proclaimed the truth. They said, our Lord is the Lord of the skies and the earth. And we're not prepared to invoke any other Lord besides Allah. Otherwise, we would be saying something that is far from the truth. And they even took that as an opportunity to invite the king. These are our people. They are taking other gods besides Allah. Why do they not bring any concrete and solid proof? Who is a greater oppressor than the person who fabricates lies against Allah? And he says that Allah commanded him to do something. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never commanded him. So the king was enraged, he was angry, and he had warned them of very serious consequences. But what he told them, you are youngsters now, I don't want to kill you, I would give you time for you to ponder over. Remember Allah also said, inna hum fitya, these were youngsters, to show you that the youngsters and the youth have got great potential. We need to exploit the potential of these youngsters because they are the future generation of our community. So he told him, I will give you respite, think over it. And this was actually a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then guided them to run to a place of sanctuary. And they made dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَا وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا Allah, you guide us what to do. This is a very important dua of the Qur'an. It comes on the first page of Surah Al-Kahf that you always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. And Allah says in the same surah, مَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ فَوَ الْمُهْدَدِ Who Allah will guide and He will be guided. وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ And who Allah will misguide, then you will never find anyone on the surface of this earth to guide Him or give Him any direction. So they had made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah had guided them for them to run away to this cave. And that is when the miracle of the time had taken place where Allah caused them to sleep in the cave for 300 solar years or 309 lunar years. And remember, there were different systems placed for their protection. Allah says, Allah guided them to such a location that the sun would not directly hit them because every day if the sun was directly hitting them for 300 years, 300 solar years, this would have definitely affected their bodies and their skin. Then Allah says, وَتَحْسَبُهُمْ إِيْقَادُ وَهُمْ رُقُودُ That when you would look at them, then you would think that they were awake whereas they were sleeping. So Allah caused them to sleep with their eyes open. So if anyone had to walk past, then he would think that these people are awake. No one would think of robbing them or harming them or injuring them. And then Allah says, وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ We turn them from right to left and from left to right. We all know when you've got a sick patient, when you've got an old person and you leave him on the bed all the time, what will happen? He will develop bed sores. The Mufassirin says, لِأَلَّا تَأْكُلَ الْأَرْضُ وَجْسَادَهُمْ So that the earth does not devour their bodies. That is why Allah turned them from side to side. And then the Quran speaks about the dog. وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِتٌ ذِرَاعِيهِ بِالْوَسِيدِ The dog had spread out its four legs by the doorstep. So Allah did not allow the dog to go inside. Because we all know that if a dog is somewhere, then the angels of mercy will leave that place. The dog remained by the doorstep. Where did the dog come from? Some say it was a stray dog, but it just had an attachment for the friends of Allah. These are friends of Allah. So even the dog had an attachment towards them. Some say while they were going, the seven of them, one shepherd joined them and he had a dog with him that he was using. So that is where the dog comes from. And then Allah Ta'ala says, another measure that was put for their protection, Allah says, if you had to peep and look at them, if someone even had to look at them, then such awe and fear would be instilled in his heart that he would run away from that place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made divine means for Allah to protect his youngsters. 300 years passes now. 
And after 300 years, we wake up. And then we start discussing, how long did we stay? Someone said, maybe just a day, or some part of a day. Because Mufassirin say they came in at the time of sunrise. And they woke up at the time of sunset. So they must have been very hungry. فَبْعَثُوا أَحَدَكُمْ بِوَرِكِكُمْ هَذِهِ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ إِنُّهَا أَسْكَى تُعَامًا Before they left their homes, they gave some sadaqa and they took some wealth with them. They said, okay, send one with this wealth and he should go and see which food of the city is the most pure. Imagine after 300 years they're waking up, they're worried about halal and haram because they knew the people in that area, they slaughter animals for idols. So none of the meat is haram and impermissible. But here he comes and he can't believe what he's seeing. This is a completely different place and the people are different and buildings are different. Even she goes to a person to buy some bread or roti and when he gives that person the coin, he looks at the coin and he calls the people around him, have you ever seen a coin of this nature? It's a very ancient coin. So they ask him, where did you get this coin? And actually he got a bit worried and he said, no, no, this is my coin, I had this coin. Then they told him, you must have found a treasure. And he says, there's no such thing like this. They said, no, definitely. Let us take you to the king. But by now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had changed the condition of this place. There was a pious, upright king who was following the deen of Isa alayhi salam. And these youngsters were also following the deen of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So when he related the incidents, they already had some type of records of these youngsters. And then they asked the details and it fitted the description of those records. And it was around that time that people were doubting whether Qiyamah is a reality or not. Some people felt on the day of Qiyamah maybe the souls only will be resurrected. The bodies will not be resurrected. The king was a pious person. He was making dua to Allah. Allah bring about some proof that I can prove to these people that Allah will resurrect the souls and Allah will resurrect the bodies as well. So then he realized that his du'as were answered. And he says he also made du'a to meet these youngsters. So then they follow this youngster. And there's different versions of the story. One version is that as they came close to the cave, he told the king and the people around him, if you're going to enter on my friends unannounced, you know, without me previously warning them, they may get very, very frightened. Let me go in and warn them. So some reports are that they went in and then it was blinded to the king. They did not know what happened. And as he went in the cave, Allah had taken all their souls away and they passed away. And that is when the people of the city began deliberating and discussing that this believer said, we'll just put some monument or structure. But the believer said, we will build a masjid here over them. And that masjid, we will worship Allah. And as I mentioned, the Quran indicates towards this. And the remnants of the masjid are still found there. And another version of the story is that they came out and they did meet the king and the people of the town, but they told them, we prefer to remain the balance of our lives in the cave. And they went back into the cave and they passed away. There are many, many lessons for us to learn from this incident. Firstly, number one, as I mentioned, Allah had specifically mentioned, inna hum fitya. Don't undermine the potential of the youth. As elders, we have to work and exploit that potential so we get the best out of them. Number two, uncompromising commitments. When it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there can be no compromise. The third is the importance of pious company. Pious company even benefited the dog that over 2,000 years has passed and Allah speaks about this dog until Qiyamah people will be reading about this dog. How much more benefit we will get if we go into the pious company and respected friends, the concern of halal. Wherever we go on the surface of this earth, remember it is our responsibility to look for halal. If we are sincere, if we are truthful, we make dua to Allah. You cannot just suffice on a halal sign. Anyone can write halal on anything. We all understand the reality of this. We will have to be very particular when it comes to halal and haram. If you want to read more of the details of this incident, we can refer to the website, the Ibn Mas'ud website. Inshallah, the details of this incident and more lessons have been highlighted. Very quickly now, just one more ziyarat we're going to go through in Amman. This is the King Abdullah Masjid and the Museum. As we would see, this masjid is kept with a very a magnificent blue mosaic 
a dome. The dome is a very beautiful dome. And when you would look inside the masjid, it is alhamdulillah quite a big masjid, but it is designed without any pillars. There's no pillars, there's no columns inside the masjid. There's also a museum that is there. In the museum you would see some very ancient old coins, you know, you hear of the dirham and dinar. Similarly, there is a letter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had written to the Roman Emperor Heraclius. And there's some old copies of the Quran. There is also a mini models of the masjid, like this is the masjid of King Hussein. Also adjacent to the museum, there is an auditorium. And the big conferences that happen in Jordan with the ulama and the qazis and the senior officials, we find these conferences happen in this place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the true understanding. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alam.